Just for your information, uh, we're going to have a, a special prayer time at the end of the service uh, for anyone who wants to be anointed and the elders will lay their hands. I put uh, James 5 and 13 and, or so in here, but before that happens, we'll end our service for the people and uh, turn the camera off. And get that out of the way because we don't that's a deeply personal thing for anyone who might want to do that and today we're coming to a place where we're going to uh, talk about the second part of our comfort zone and uh, we'll call it the edge of the comfort zone or moving beyond that and uh, we have some different images we're going to show you a little later on and uh, we'll have a nice uh, prayer time as well and uh, for those who might know Barb Winters, uh, she's paralyzed from the, her whole left side is paralyzed. I was in to see her a couple days ago at the regional hospital, and uh, but they have scheduled her for rehab, because they think she might get a lot of that back, And but she's still looking at three, maybe four months in, in the regional hospital. She had a stroke at 4 o'clock in the morning. She lied on the floor for six hours. Uh, she normally leaves her front door open, but she locked it. And uh, she always opens her curtains in the morning. And so her daughter was driving by and saw the curtains weren't open. So she went in there and eventually they broke in a window to get her. And uh, she still has a lot of blood burn because she's trying to crawl around with one side to get to a phone or to get to something. But she's, you know, she's got, seems to have a fairly good attitude right now. She can talk and not much drooping on the one side. That's in fairly good shape, but she says there's nothing. There's no nothing. And uh, another lady lives next to Pearl Dina in Blacks uh, is uh, in the hospital as well. Georgina Gadet. She's 95, but she has pneumonia. And I went in to see her and uh, see if she had, they were all in there. And I said, can I come in? And they said, who are you? I said, well, I'm a Protestant minister. And I'd like to come in. But I know you're Catholics. And I know about Catholics and Protestants because my uncles were in the IRA, but they were in the kaboom part of the IRA. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, <laughs> they're gone now. We won't speak evil of them. They're dead. And, you know. and so I said, uh, and I, I was trying to get it. I said, if I, if I got one of those little G.I. Joe dolls and glued it to my cross... Can I come in your room? <laughs> right? And uh, she had a good, good laugh, but she's having a hard time breathing, and it's getting worse. It's, it's sad. 95, double pneumonia. So we'll pray for her later on and uh, continue to pray for some other people as well. I, I brought, Lois said, take the paper and the pen to the front. Are, are there any other people, when we come to our prayer time later on, is there anyone else that we would, or any other situation that we would care to pray for today? Most of you know that Nathan lost his job at the fat chocolate factory, and uh, he's been down in Nova Scotia looking for work down there, oh. and might end up at the dockyard down there. They're looking for work earning this, so I don't know. So we pray for her, and so Amanda will be, whatever she makes at the gas station, that's all they have. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll see what happens uh, from there. So many things going on. Uh, we're going to sing a beautiful song, and then we're going to open in prayer. And uh, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. Open. I better take this up a few. There we go. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to. Oh, uh -huh. 
Lord, it's good to be here in your presence in this place that we have set aside for your purpose, that we have sanctified, Lord. And Lord, today we want to glorify your name with all that we say and do and act and react, Lord. But we also want and invite you to flow in this place in a powerful way as I know that you're already here. Father, we're going to be talking about a few difficult things today that for people to do, Lord. And so they're going to need your power and your strength. They're going to need your presence, Lord. And I pray that each and every one of us, it's somewhere in a word, in a, in a lyric, in, in a message, in a face, Lord, somewhere, that we will feel the intimacy of your presence in our lives, Father. And so I ask, Lord, that you be with us, that you speak to us, Lord. And then when it comes time for me to preach, Lord, I would ask a blessing upon your messenger, that people would not hear my words or my illustrations, but Holy Spirit, they would hear you and sense you, that they would leave here with a power and a strengthening and a reassurance and a renewal, Lord. And we'll praise you and thank you in the powerful name of Yeshua, Jesus. Amen. 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 I love this song, Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I live your name on
August. <laughs> the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. It's six o'clock or so and uh, thank you Brian the heat was on which was very nice and uh, I was praying for all of you and uh, different situations in our lives and um, sometimes when we when we go to prayer we think that our prayers are not good enough we think that our prayers are not eloquent enough that we don't use flowery enough language. And I would tell you that, you know, you can say, hi, Lord, I'm here, speak to me, amen. You're good to go. Because prayer is simply a conversation with God. And he wants to hear the good things and the bad things. He wants to hear the big things and the small things. Um, but he wants you to know that you are loved, right? That you are needed. That he cares for you. And so as we head towards our time of prayer, I want to sing a beautiful song called, You Say, You Say. I am you. 
kill your God. You have every victory. No. And you say,
that people might come in here and not only hear about you, Lord, and, and discover you, Yeshua, but to, to be loved by us. That they can come here and no one is going to judge them. That they're going to be loved. They're going to be needed and wanted in the future, Lord. And I thank you for that. Father, I want to thank you for our offerings. I want to thank you, Lord, that we have the resources to reach out and, and do great things in our mission work in Sri Lanka. The way that you have been able to touch the lives of the disabled, the lives of newborns, the lives of cancer patients, the lives of those who hunger, the lives of those who who have poor houses and poor housing, the lives of those who need to know that they're being helped by a small church in Canada, a small Christian church in the midst of Buddhism, in the midst of so many other religions. You reign supreme, Father. We praise you and thank you for that. And so receive our offerings in the heart in which we give them, Lord. And use them not only to prosper this church in our communities, but to reach out and touch those outside of this area, Lord. Father, again, I ask a prayer, a blessing upon each person sitting in the pew today. And those at home, wherever they are. That you would touch them deeply through this message of escape. This message of freedom. This message of life, Lord, that you are about to bring today. And we will thank you in the precious and holy name of Jesus. Amen. Lois well, is going to show you a picture of an old destroyer. And, uh, yeah, she's old. In uh, 1975, I found myself in the South Pacific on this thing. Can't believe it's been that long. And uh, one of the things I wanted to do maybe was to dive and be a ship's diver, a rescue diver, and all those other things, which I eventually did. But in our training to be a diver, one of the things we had to do was uh, overcome uncomfortableness. One of the things we had to do was on the bottom, 50 feet down, there was a rope that went a mile and a half. And we had to go down at night, and we had to pull along that thing with our mask blacked out so we couldn't see anything and keep going until we ran out of air then ditched our tanks and tried to find our way to the surface. We'd jump off of things in the night and in the day. On the bow of the ship, you'll see a couple people up there. Now, this was uh, alongside and uh, was getting ready to be decommissioned at that time. And... Uh, and so it was about 10 feet higher in the water. It was a long way, about 40 feet to the water. And we had to put our gear on, and then we had to go up to the pointy end, up to the bow for you non nautical people. And we had to climb over the guardrail, and we had to take two steps, and we had to plunge 40 feet to the water, hopefully. And you had to be very careful, um, especially young men, because if you carry your flippers with you when you go into the water or put them on when you're in the water. If you put them on before you go in the water, they end up up here somewhere. <laughs> it's very uncomfortable. <laughs> so you don't do that. And so there's some things we need. You can show this list here, I think. The one is that you have to stand inside of the rail. You stand inside the rail. So you're standing inside your comfort zone. Then you have to climb all over the guardrail, right? So when you get to the edge of your comfort zone, you're going to have to step outside. Oh, your back can still be against the rail. You might be hanging on to the rail if you want, but you have to step outside. And then three, you need to gather up your courage to make that jump. You see, because you can't see the water below you. See, the round down goes like this. So when you're walking out, you can't see where you're going to fall. The fourth thing is, because of that, it's slippery. They made ships like that during the Cold War, which I sailed a great deal of, chasing submarines and such, uh, so that if there was a nuclear fallout, it would just flow off. There were sprinklers everywhere. If you took a step and you weren't assured of that, you were going to go in head first, back first, you could break your back, break your neck, you could really harm yourself. You had to be very sure before you made the, take, 
the first step. And then you stepped out. Now, by the time you could see the water below you, you were committed. You're going down. You can't stop. It's done. It's like an airplane, 1976, San Diego, before I met Lois, parachuting outside of the city. In a round shoot, they take you up in a plane. And they say, get out of the strut and hold on. You get out of the strut and you hold on. And they say, when we give you the command to let go, you let go, and down you go. And so you climb out there and you hold on. They say, let go. You don't let go. <laughs> let go. You don't let go. You close your eyes, you squint your eyes, you don't want to see anything. And you thought, okay, maybe once. No, no, I'm not ready. Not ready yet. <laughs> and the plane's up there. Once you're committed, you're committed. You're going down to the water. So long way to the water, it's exhilarating. And when you get back to the surface, you see how far you jumped and you want to jump again. And uh, we're going to use this experience I had many years ago to talk about reaching our comfort zone and going beyond our comfort zone. 2 Timothy 1 and 7, Lois will have it up here for you. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of what? Of power and of love and of discipline. And I think we need to say this together down below. Let's, let's do that together. For God has not given me a spirit of that I can't hear a thing. I was saying it. Were you saying it? Yeah. Were they saying it? Yeah. Were you saying it softly? Why were you saying it softly? Because we're soft people. No, but you need to declare this. Declare it. It's a truth. Let's declare it together. For God has not given me a spirit of timidity, but of power and of love and of discipline. Good for you. We're going to look at the seven steps to getting outside of our comfort zone. So I want to show the ship again. And, uh, and I want you in your mind's eye... Uh, to see yourself standing on the bow just inside the guardrail, up right near the, the nose of the, the ship itself. Everything inside the guardrail is your comfort zone, your place of safety, your place of familiarity, your place of control. Most people love living inside their control zone. Most people have a, 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 that kind of, of comfort zone, even if they would admit it or not. The guardrail there... For me in that day represented the edge of my comfort zone. Because as long as I was on that side of the guardrail, I was safe. I could go to the hatch, go down below, I could disappear, get off the boat. And so when I stood up and bellied up to that guardrail, I was at the edge of my comfort zone. In your comfort zone, you might feel the same thing. And you might say to me, literally, I would literally die. If I were to do that, literally die if I had to step outside my comfort zone for some reason. And so let's talk about death just for a second to find out where we stand. Genesis 2 and 7 reads this way. Then the Lord God formed man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. Now, I'm writing slowly a uh, a Bible study in the book of Revelation and in Genesis, the book ends of the Bible. And I read a lot and study a lot. And, and so I was watching this uh, video and it was a conference they were having. And the gentleman was up there saying, well, uh, so he read this passage and he said that Adam was lying there motionless and God breathed into his nostrils and he became, you know, he came alive. He stood up. He was, and a, a lady stood up. Very eloquent, very learned, soft-spoken, an older lady. And she said, excuse me. She said, uh, that's wrong. <laughs> and uh, you can imagine a guy thinking, okay, well, go for it. <laughs> and she said, I've read the Bible quite often. And I've read some original Hebrew and other things. God did not breathe into Adam or Adam. And he said, well, what did he do? He said, God formed Adam of the dust, uh, of the dirt of the ground into a body, a recognizable face, arms, everything. 
But it was still sand. It was still dirt. It was still dust. See, God didn't breathe into to, to, to the man's nostrils the breath of life. God breathed into the dust. And when God breathed into the dust, the dust became a human being and stood up. The mechanical uh, translation is this. I think I have it on the screen. I'm not sure. It says, uh, and Yahweh, right, which means he exists, and Elohim, which means the power. So he exists of the powers molded or formed the human of powder from the ground, and he exhaled, ex ex exhaled into his nostrils a breath of life, and a human existed for a being of life. This is the original Hebrew translation written here. And I'm going to show you two symbols right now. There they are. Now, the two dashes, the two, like, uh, looks like quotes or whatever on the end, one has two, one has one. This is the word form. This is the word molded. This is the word put together. And on the end of that word is something called a yud. A yud. And you will see that there are two yuds on the top and only one yud on the bottom. But both the words are the word to form, to build, to mold. Why? When they're talking about man, when they're talking about humans, there's two yuds. When they're talking about animals, there's one yud. And the reason is for this. They say one yud in this word for a human being represents who they are in this world, and one represents who they are in the world to come. And sadly for you who think that Fido's going to be in heaven with you, there's only one yud on the bottom, and so when they made, I'm sorry, Debbie, I'm crushing her. When they, made, when they made the animals, they made the animals for this world. Yes, there will be animals in heaven, in the new earth, in the new heaven, new earth, but not the ones you have with you now, sadly. Get that woman a tissue. <laughs> and what they were saying here with the two yous was this, that when you come to the end of this life here, the person you are that was made for this world goes back to dust, goes back to dirt. And the person that you are that was made for the world to come leaves. God creates the dirt and the sand and breathes life in a spirit into Adam. And when you cease to exist on earth, God takes that spirit back with him to heaven. If you have said with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has sent his son to live, to die, took your sins to the cross, took them to the grave, left them there and rose victorious at the right hand of the Father, you will never die. That's just the word we use here. Your body will go back, that first you, your body will go back to the dust, but you, your essence, yourself, your spirit, your everything that you are will go to heaven. Paul says, when this earthly tent is cast aside, you'll have a new body not made by earthly hands, but by heavenly hands, and that's what is going to happen. And so if you believe that and you've declared that, you will never die. You will never die. You're already living forever. We're just going to do it in different places. And so, when you climb over the guardrail, are you going to die when you step out of your comfort zone? No. No, you won't. No, you won't. Ephesians 3 and 16 says this, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power and through the spirit and through the inner man. And these are the words that Paul prayed for many years ago for regenerated spirit. He prayed for your inner Person, He prayed for the new self that you took on when you gave your life to the Lord. And he prays that that new one has life. Now we know that we have the new nature and the old nature, and the old nature is fighting against the new. That's where Paul gets all confused. Oh, I do what I don't want to do, and I don't want to do what I want to do, and why do I do this when I don't want to? It goes on and on, and he's confused about all that. Well, what he's saying is the new you that God has given you is he prays, Paul prays, even now, 2,000 years later, that that inner part of you would be strengthened to do the things 
that you wanted to do. I want to put up with the average person's anxiety is focused on. It's up here on the front. 40% of the things that you think will happen, your anxiety, your fear, your frustration, whatever it is, whatever you're feeling, 40% of what you're feeling never happens. Never happens. It doesn't. 30% of the things that you get anxiety about are things from the past. Well, once they're past, you can't change your past. You can't hang on to your past. Because if you hang on to the things in the past, or the dumb things you've done, and I, and I was very open uh, to uh, the Bible study group the other day about all the dumb things I did, and some of the people I disappointed in my youth and my teenage years, you can't go back and undo that. But if, if that plagues you, if that stays with you, it, it, it digs a bitter root that robs you of life. And we can't have that. 12% of the things that you have anxiety about are criticisms by other people. Who? Do you really care what other people think of you? Right? You should only think about what God thinks of you. You should define your self-worth by what God thinks of you and not what other people think of you or want to think of you. 10% is about your health, your anxiety. The problem with that is the more anxiety you have, the more anxiety you're going to get. It's sort of a, a circle. And then here's the thing. Because we're getting ready to step out of our comfort zone, right? We've stepped over the guardrail, we're into unknown territory, and 8% of the real problems that you might encounter as you're reaching outside your comfort zone is something that you might face. Just 8 out of 100 things that are on your mind, and I think you can handle that. Then you have to gather up your courage. So now you're standing on the other side, go put that ship up there again. Do I have it up there? Yeah. Somewhere. It's in there. Anyways, you're standing on the other side of the guardrail. There you go. Right? Your back's to the guardrail. And the round gun, it's, it, it's deceiving from here, but it's, it's like it's from here to the knob on the end there. It's, and it goes down and then underneath. And so you have to gather up your courage. Listen to this. During his years as Premier of the Soviet Union, Nikita Khrushchev denounced the policies and the atrocities of Joseph Stalin, both nasty people. And, uh, and once he censured Stalin in a speech, and, uh, there was a heckler in the crowd. And the heckler said, you were once, a, once Stalin's cronies. Why didn't you say something? Why didn't you step up? Khrushchev barked. Who said that? Silence. Not a person made a move. Nobody said a word. And then quietly Khrushchev replied, Now you know why I didn't say anything. <laughs> Perhaps you don't move out of your comfort zone because you're afraid of Satan. Maybe your Khrushchev and your Stalin is Satan. But we've talked a hundred times, we've talked a thousand times. Satan only has the power that you give him, and no more. No more. Satan cannot do to you what you don't want Satan to do to you. If he has power, it's because you've released it to him. So don't. That's pretty simple. Don't. Be courageous. And now you're on the, the round down here. It's, uh, it's kind of scary. See, uh, what you do when you're in this uncharted territory outside of your comfort zone is you're going to have to do things and be with people and act in different ways that perhaps you haven't done before. And, uh, and if I was on the ship and I took a step and decided, no, I don't want to do this, and I turned, I'm breaking my neck or I'm breaking my back or I'm going to harm myself. Or if I managed to grab the guardrail and hang in there, then I would never in my life, there'd be people now that I sailed with 40 years ago that'd be saying, remember that time <laughs> you're dangling off the side of the ship because you didn't want to fall? And you think, no one remembers all that stuff, do you? Uh, when I retired, Lois and I had to get, I didn't want to do it, but you have to go and do all the, get your certificates and all this other, and they gave Lois a certificate from who was it, Trudeau or somebody? Or I don't know, not this was Trudeau, maybe the last one. Or so. Anyway, it doesn't matter. But uh, then they read letters, and they, they, they brought this letter up of a garbage can. 
And um, I, I know, I know, I know. So there came a day when I was a young sailor that the, the food wasn't very well. And we were up working, because I was a technician, we got down to the, the food line. And it was only, the pizza was just this, this hard film of oil on top of the pizza, but that was it. And they put this clink, clink, clink on my plate. And I said, where's the rest of the food? That's it, you don't like it, you know? And which I, in, before I was a Christian, I reached across and pulled him off the steam line to, to warm up his nether regions <laughs> because he didn't give me food. And someone tapped my shoulder and said, put them down, so I put them down. And they said, you gotta go complain to the officer upstairs, the supply officer. So I went up and, and he wasn't there and I got mad and I took the piece of thing and I threw it in the garbage can and I'm just turning to leave. This guy was not very smart, was he? I was just turning to leave and he comes and he says, you can have anything you want. You can have steak, you can have chicken, you can have well, all this other stuff that we never ever had. And uh, I said, no, all we get is this stuff. It's in the garbage can. He's looking and he said, I don't see anything in there. I said, I, I picked him up. <laughs> I said, let me help you see it. So I picked him up and I turned this fly off upside right down in the garbage can. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, that was so long ago. I was a whole different person. But it's come, come back to haunt me a couple of times. I might even meet this young man one day. He won't be a young man anymore. When you step out, you have to commit. You've committed. Oh, I committed. He was upside down. <laughs> He's up to his waist in the pail. <laughs> he wasn't happy. You know how it is. Anyway, <clears throat> I digress. So, but what I'm saying is that you have to commit. If you don't commit, it's going to cause pain for you. It's going to cause pain for other people. And if you embarrass yourself, that embarrassment is going to be with you for many, many, many years to come. And so don't do that. Once you build up your courage... Step out smartly, as uh, when we did our army type of training stuff, someone said, um, if, if you turn the troop to the right instead of the left and there's a cliff on the right, you better march them smartly right off the cliff. And, uh, and so take that step. By the time you see the water, you're committed. I want you to listen to some of these quotes. I think I put them up on the screen here for you. Did I? The comfort zone is nothing else but a graveyard for your dreams and ideas. Anonymous. By leaving your comfort zone behind and taking a leap of faith into something new, you find out who you're truly capable of becoming. Again, anonymous. If, if it doesn't challenge you, it doesn't change you. Again, anonymous. And this from Mark Burnett. I think he does the, the Survivor show and some other stuff. The producer. He says, I guarantee you that the day you step outside of your comfort zone by making success your goal is the day you discover that adversity, risk, and daring will make your life sweeter than it's ever been before. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14 and 28. Peter said to him, Lord, if it's you, command me to come out on the water. And he said, come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came forward to Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became frightened and began sinking. And he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him. And said to him, you of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind stopped. And those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, certainly you are God's son. When you step off the side, you have made a commitment. You've made a commitment. It's a long way to the water, but it's exhilarating. I've told you before. Uh, four of us went to, I've been to Africa a bunch of times, a bunch of bunch. And uh, one of my first times there, I was the junior pastor. There was four of us, but I had a beard. And I'm a second career pastor because I was in the Navy, so I was older and I had a beard. And because I was older and because I had a beard, the, the local natives thought that I was El Jefe. I was a big one, right? I was a, they would have taken you. I would take you with me next time because, right? You could share. Anyway, so... So we were celebrating because we were helping them with uh, cooperative agriculture and aquaculture so they could live above subsistence farming so they could get together and buy and sell a few things. And they were celebrating because it had been successful. And they made this pig, roast, hog, whatever it is. 
And uh, they gutted it, which was nice, but they basically stuck a stick up its button on its mouth and hung it on a fire. And uh, yeah, I built it like this. And uh, so then they rotated it all day. They didn't skin it or anything. And I was first in line. So here I am back here. I'm on the inside of the garden. I'm in my comfort zone. There's people over there that got spears and fancy grass thingies and war paint. And, and they say, you've got to go first. You're going to be fed first. You're the honored one. And uh, I step over the rail. And I'm thinking, please, mommy, please. And I, I step out towards this woman who had maybe three teeth. She was quite old, worn out of it, and small, but she had this very sharp machete. <laughs> and she looks at me and she smiles and she goes, ha, ha. She whacks it twice and pulls this wedge, by the burnt hair and skin, pulls this wedge of meat out of this hog and goes like this. And now I'm at the point, right? I'm on the round down. I'm getting ready to jump. I'm getting ready to leave my comfort zone completely. If I had pulled back, I would have insulted her. I would have insulted all the rest of the people. And I didn't want to insult people that had sharp spears. That can't be a good thing. And I didn't want to look badly on our group. And so I, I, I stepped in. I took this thing. And they're all waiting with bated breath for me to take a, a, a breath. And I, you know, please, Lord, I... Took a little nibble off the end of that, and it, it didn't kill me. And it's, then everyone smiled, and I could back away, and other people got in the lineup. And uh, uh, did I want to eat that hunk of meat? <laughs> no. Uh, did I want that experience, something like that again? Yes, I wanted more experiences. I was nervous on the one side of the ship, and I was nervous on one side of that village. And I. Heart was racing, my blood was pumping as I prepared to jump off the boat with all my gear on off the ship. And my heart was pumping as I was going to step towards this lady with the big machete with the guards and spears there, right? And uh, um, it was accelerating in the end. It was wonderful. And no one saw me give it to all the kids that were in behind me. <laughs> and I think they even ate the hair. Would I do it again? Yes. Did I do something like that again? Yes. Yes. Um, Joshua 1 and 9. Have I not commanded you be strong and courageous? Do not tremble to be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Author Steve Maraboli said this, his picture here. Cemeteries are full of unfulfilled dreams, if you can find them, man. There he is. Countless echoes of could have and should have. Countless books unwritten. Countless songs unsung. I want to live my life, he said, in such a way that when my body is laid to rest, it will be a well-needed rest from a life well-lived, a song well-sung, a book well-written, opportunities well-explored, and a love well-expressed. Jesus got out, or Peter got out of the boat. Once he left the boat, he was committed, just like me, plunging towards the water. He was either going to sink or he was going to swim. And he got nervous and started to sink. But what was waiting for him? The arms of Jesus, outstretched to save him. And I will tell you this. You need to step over that guardrail. And you need to gather up the courage that God has already given to you. And you need to take a couple quick steps off the side, even though you can't see below you, and plunge to the water. If you are Peter in the boat, you need to get out of the boat and start walking towards Yeshua. Because he called him. And if you start to sink, God was there. Yeshua was there, arms outstretched to save him. And I'm saying today, as a Christian, as a follower of Yeshua, God is calling for each and every one of us to leave our comfort zones, 
to invite someone for a coffee, to chat with someone, to, to try something different, a mission, or walk in the neighborhood, or pamphlets, or something, or, or to work in the church, or maybe to come up here and speak, or to read scripture, or to do something within the church. God's calling you to do that, and that takes getting out of your comfort zone. And the only thing that you need to remember is this, that when you step out of your comfort zone, when you're plunging towards the water, whose arm is waiting for you? Jesus. You cannot fail. You cannot fail. And so get out of your comfort zone. Leave it. Experience a different life. Experience a different food or, or something else. Do that. I'm going to call you to do that. I'm going to stop in a second. I'm going to call you to do that probably next month. I met a, a nice lady, Victoria. At the, she works. She's a banker, but she works. She's from uh, uh, Nigeria. Works uh, at the uh, at the uh, Save Easy up there, right? And uh, they said she was a great cook and a great baker and all that. And I said, if I asked you, I said, would you bake or cook us as a congregation a bunch of Nigerian food so that after the service one day we would go down and experience this, right? And she said, here's my name, here's my phone number, call me when you want it. Amazing. And so sometime in the near future, I'm going to stand up and I'm, or I'm going to tell you the week before and I'm going to say, guess what? We're all eating Nigeria today. And you might think, ah, she makes jollof rice. So if you eat anything, eat jollof rice. I loved it when I was over there. Every, every country has their own kind. That's a safe rice, right? Um, but I will ask you to get out of your comfort zone and try. Lois used to do that with the kids in Sunday school. Once a month, they did a different country and they had toys from the country and games from the country and we'd make home food from that country and each of those kids had to eat something from that country to experience it whether they wanted to or not not a lot but they had to try you can't say I don't like it unless you stick it in your mouth right yeah I'm going to pray in a second I'm, and I'm going to end the service for those who are at home who are listening at home uh, because we're going to have a moment now and where you can come forward and be prayed for. Now, I put it in your, in your bulletin here. Uh, is anyone among you suffering? Then he must pray. Is anyone cheerful? He sings praises. Is anyone among you sick? Then he must call the elders of the church there to pray over him. Anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And that prayer offered in faith will restore those who are sick. Or those who have sinned. Or those who have issues. And we're going to give you an opportunity to do that. In just a minute. And maybe that for you is stepping out of your comfort zone. But you must know that the arm of Jesus is waiting for you. Now, I'm not compelling anyone to do this. If no one does it today, that's okay. That's okay, right? I, I, I don't want to force anyone. I don't want you to do anything you don't want to do. One of the things that, that we uh, are known for here in Beaver is that we're pretty... Pretty laid back. We give a serious message, but we're pretty laid back and we're loving. And uh, you know, you want to wear your jeans, wear your jeans. You want to dress up, dress up. It doesn't matter to me. And right. And uh, we know that it takes everyone to make the church run, not just one or two of us. Everybody. And uh, and the second thing is, you will never be forced to do anything you don't want to do. Because if I force you, and you feel compelled to do that, you're going to leave here and you won't come back. And I don't want that. And so I'm just going to have a small prayer for those who are at home. Thank you, Father, for this message. Thank you for our time together, Lord. Help each and every one of us to climb out of our comfort zone, Lord, uh, to reach, to stretch, to live, to write, to, to sing, to explore, to travel, uh, to do whatever, Father. Help us uh, to make that plunge like me that day so many years ago. Step out in blind faith, not seeing where you're going, and step off and let Jesus take us there. And we'll thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen.